Uh, there are some freebies that we would love to get to uh, homes that would find them useful. And those include still those boxes of incandescent light bulbs, which will soon be going away, but also some printing cartridges, which of course we know those don't come cheap and they are new ones. And so if you would check them out and see if you have a printer that uses one of those, uh, again, they are there for the taking, love to get them free to a, to a good home. Um, also downstairs, in terms of gift giving, there are a number, number of things to pick up or purchase. Uh, I mentioned last week the equal exchange items. I won't uh, go over that again in detail, but suffice to say, please feel free to stop into the Sunny School Room, where you'll find the other stuff besides the coffee. And the coffee, of course, is in the foyer in its usual spot. And there are a lot of items there which can make really great gifts. Uh, in a sense, giving twice, as it were, to the person you were passing them on, as well as to the growers and the producers who get a fair return for their labors. Um, in addition, downstairs, several youth group things going on. We have that ongoing silent auction in the foyer of some very unique church keepsakes that have been kindly donated to us. The details are in the bulletin or down there. Uh, we have Knobel's tickets still available. Olivia would be the person to see if you are interested in great stocking stuffers there that sort of transport us to a warmer time. Uh, in addition, today, the dips, if you were kind enough to order those recently, Amy will be the person to see for those, and uh, she will be available here this morning and as well this afternoon at the Gingerbread Bash. So lots of good stuff that is uh, there for the taking and or the purchasing, and thank you uh, for your help with all of those, the ones that involve especially the purchasing. Congregational meeting right after worship will go immediately into the meeting. Everyone is very welcome to attend. There, it's not a, a secret thing, you know, where you need to flash the sign or anything to get in. Uh, it is open. Uh, we need especially voting members for the meeting. And voting members, as per the Constitution, are people who are confirmed and then in addition who have been active. And it's a pretty low bar of activity, basically one communion, one contribution in the current or previous years. So if you fit that bar of activity, looking out, I see those who all do, uh, please be sure to stay. And again, everyone is more than welcome to sit in as we go to that congregational meeting. Following the meeting then, we go to, um, uh, council will be staying here for a, a meeting, for our December meeting. Miss Laurie, as I mentioned last week, is looking for some helpers to set up some tables and chairs downstairs for this afternoon's event. There's a nice big group of folks coming out for that at about four o'clock. And so if you would have a couple of minutes to pop back to the Sunny School Room Fellowship Hall here below us and help Miss Laurie with that, she'd be greatly appreciative. And then, of course, this afternoon is the women's meeting and the gingerbread bash coming up at four. And it's a very cool gingerbread, you know, sort of. Uh, but uh, uh, it, it's a, Miss Laurie has a really wonderful project. You're going to love it. It's very, very nice. Downstairs in the foyer, as you probably already could not miss, we have offering envelopes for 2022. If you can help us by taking yours, those of family members, those of neighbors, it's always great to get them on their way so that that uh, table condenses down as we get closer to Christmas Eve. Winter Bible study, uh, the details about that are in the bulletin. Please check with me uh, by any means that you would wish, stopping by, calling, emailing, all of the above to let me know if you would like to be a part of that. Um, we are very, very pleased that our sister in Christ, Louise, came through her procedure this week, and I'm looking back, and right there she is. And there's nothing better than being able to give thanks in prayer while you're looking at the person involved. That is the most magnificent thing. So we continue to give thanks, even as we pray for continued healing for Louise and all who are in need. With that, then, we go to our prelude this third Sunday of the season of Advent. Amen.
Please rise if you're able to do so. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the Lord of Israel, who comes to set us free, the mighty Savior who comes to show mercy, the dawn from on high who guides us into peace. Amen. Let us now come before God in confession. To you, O God, we lift up our souls. You know us through and through. We confess our sins to you. Remember not our sins. Remember us with your steadfast love. Show us your ways, teach us your paths, and lead us in justice and truth. For the sake of your goodness in Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Sisters and brothers, come with joy and draw water from the well of salvation. Remember the gift of baptism. Our sins washed away in the name of Jesus. We belong to Christ. We are anointed to serve. Stand up and raise your heads. The reign of God is near. Amen. You may be seated for our opening song. Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Stir up the wills of your faithful people, Lord God, and open our ears to the preaching of John, that rejoicing in your salvation, we may bring forth the fruits of repentance. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
Let us pray. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe. Your prophets spoke of a day when the desert would blossom and waters would break forth in the wilderness. Bless us as we now light three candles on this wreath. Strengthen our hearts as we prepare for the coming of the Lord. May he indeed give water to all who thirst, for he is our light and our salvation. Blessed be God forever. Amen. The first reading is from Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 14 to 20. Sing aloud, O daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, rejoice and exalt with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away the judgments against you. He has turned away your enemies. The King of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. You shall fear disaster no more. On that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, Do not fear, O Zion, do not let your hands grow weak. The Lord your God is in your midst, a warrior who gives victory. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exult over you with loud singing, as on a day of festival. I will remove disaster from you so that you will not bear reproach for it. I will deal with all your oppressors at that time, and I will save the lame and gather the outcasts, and I will change their shame into praise and renown in all the earth. At that time, I will bring you home at the time when I gather you, for I will make you renowned and praised among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your eyes, says the Lord. May we read responsibly Isaiah chapter 12, verses 2 to 6. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid, for the Lord God is my strength and my might and has become my salvation. And you will say in that day, give thanks to the Lord, call on God's name, make known the deeds of the Lord among the nations, proclaim that his that this name is exalted. <laughs> Shout aloud and sing for joy, O royal Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One, Israel. The second reading is from Philippians 4, chapter 4, verses 4 to 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. <coughs> Once again, please stand uh, if you are able to do so as we read today from the Holy Gospel. Once again, the Gospel of Luke, the third chapter, beginning at the seventh verse. Glory to you, Lord. John the Baptist said to the crowds who came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now, the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. The crowds asked him then, what then should we do? In reply, he said to them, whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked John, teacher, what should we do? He said to them, collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, and we, what should we do? He said to them, do not extort money from anyone, 
by threats or false accusation, and be satisfied with your wages. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, John proclaimed the good news to the people. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. You may be seated. It is uh, on a Sunday such as this one, the third Sunday of Advent, December the 12th, approximately halfway through, in our case, the journey of Advent, uh, also, of course, approximately halfway through the period of December waiting for Christmas Day. It's a day like this where we really see the huge disconnect between, on the one hand, the celebration of the Christian year, which is, of course, the season of Advent and preparation, which runs all the way up until uh, Christmas Eve itself, December 24th, and only then, for the following 12 days, becomes what we properly call Christmas time. The disconnect between this and um, the secular observance that has evolved over the years, and again, in which we all have uh, our feet solidly placed during all of the time in which we're not gathered here, but which we know begins somewhere after Halloween, uh, generally speaking, always by about the beginning of November, right? Because that is anymore when the Christmas songs come on the radio, several stations in our area that go full up 24 hour a day Christmas. And that continues then up until basically 11.59 p.m. on December 25, at which point for the most part, bam, it's over and done. Now, sometimes uh, if Christmas like this year comes over the weekend, it might be that those radio stations keep going with Christmas songs till say the end of the day on Sunday. But guaranteed, sure as we're here this morning by Monday morning at the latest, if not at 11.59 Christmas day, it's done. And it's back to regular programming. And if you go into stores or restaurants, that have been doing nothing but Christmas for weeks and weeks and weeks, it's over at that point. The other um, big disconnect I find between what we do here on Sunday morning in the season of Advent and the rest of the larger observance concerns John the Baptist, right? For us here on Sunday morning, for us as Christians journeying through the season of Advent, John is this major figure. He looms large in what we do, in what we hear, in what we say. But you step out those doors downstairs, nothing. There is not a song, popular or otherwise, that you're going to hear that has anything to say about John. Um, you're not going to see a scene in anyone's yard showing John the Baptist, you know, maybe standing by the river and people coming to be baptized. You're not going to see any inflatable figures of John with his locust hair garments and maybe ready to pop a locust and wild honey and camel's hair garments, locusts to eat and honey. Not going to see that anywhere that you go, John missing, largely, in fact, in my experience, unknown. And it's not hard to figure out why, right? Because John just can't be commercialized. 
you know, um, try as you might, there is, there is nothing with which John is associated which is going to conjure up anything in the way of warm and fuzzy feelings. There's nothing with which John is associated that is going to prompt uh, the spirit of buying lots of stuff and passing it on to other people. Um, there, there's nothing with which John is associated, nothing that he says that is going to make us come away with the warm, fuzzy feelings that we very much all, being human beings, like to have this time of year as we think about our lives and the world around us. You know, the, the rest of it, the angels, the shepherds, the wise men, not to even mention a cuddly little wonderful baby who can't get kind of warm and fuzzy and gaga about that, you know, those things can be manipulated. Those things can be schmaltzed over and they can be made wonderful and pretty and non-threatening and non-judgmental and non-offensive. And we can kind of, you know, take them in various measures to craft our holiday celebration, kind of like picking off of a food bar someplace, right? You know, just the right amount of secular and sacred and such things. But John just doesn't work. John just doesn't fit. Standing there with fire in his eyes, no warm fuzzies, no pretty colors, camel's hair, ugh. You know, locusts, not really. Uh, there is only this unadulterated fire of his message. A message that is anything but nice and neat and pretty to hear. A message that is threatening and judgmental and offensive. And all the more so because we realize as we hear the reading this morning that it is a message not to those people, whoever they happen to be, you know, the, the bad people, the, the non-good church people. No, in fact, we find this morning that it is directed to people exactly like you and me. First of all, truth be told, me, right, as one of the leaders who so often have gone off the rails and gone astray and led God's people away. We are held to a much higher and more frightening standard than anyone. Fact is, John is talking there at the riverbank to the good church people, folks just like you and me, who are the ones who have gone out to hear him. They're the ones who care enough to know that there's something happening out there that they've been hearing about, and they want to be a part of it. They know, they have the sense anyway, that God is up to something. And so it's those religious establishment people like you and me. People, let's be honest, who can start to feel kind of good about ourselves, you know. Um, maybe especially this time of year, because as we get on to Christmas and Christmas Eve, we see in our midst the people that we know maybe don't tend to be here much during the rest of the year, but we're the folks who have been kind of slogging along, you know, week after week. We made it through the end of the long green season of Pentecost. We've come through the weeks of Advent. And it can be kind of easy this time of year to look around and say, yeah, you know, I'm, you know, I'm one of the regulars here. I, you know, this place depends on me and it's, it's important that I'm here. And we can sort of get down inside because you don't want to let it show, mind you, but just down inside, we can start to feel kind of proud and, and pleased that by darn, we're pretty good people. But then we run smack into John. John, who it turns out refuses completely to recognize our credentials as good and proper church people. Instead, like, I kind of picture him as the kind of person who would make maybe a really good bouncer. You know, I, that, that's the image that I have of him in mind, that just as with his words, I could sort of easily picture him 
grabbing somebody like me by the scruff of the neck and dragging us off the side and saying, what are you doing here, Bruner? You know? What about this thing? What about those ways in which you, and in effect, dragging me and us over to show us that if we're gonna, if we're gonna hang out with God, and if we're gonna be God's people, especially this time, as the Lord is coming into our midst, well, there's some important truths that we have to get straight. Like number one, as he drags us over and shows us what's printed there in black and white, well, we don't end up looking very good. Rule number one, forget thinking that you're somebody. Forget thinking that you've got this God business and this church business all worked out, that you've somehow got God by the short hairs. No, to, to put it in biblical prose, we are, according to John, like a nest of poisonous snakes. Or, not much better, we are like dry, dead wood, just ready for the fire. Rule number one, drop the attitude, Broner. Get a new look on things. Consider who you're dealing with. Which leads us then down to rule number two, house policy number two, and that is that God is not one bit impressed with attendance records, communion records, contributing records, all the kind of stuff that are near and dear to pastor types hearts and congregational record keeping, all of which is a part of life as a part of the evangelical Lutheran church in America. It turns out God is not one bit impressed by the baptismal certificate locked away in the safe box or the certificate of confirmation because according to John, God is God and so if God takes a notion, God can raise up baptized and even voting members from the stones. So what we've done, the credentials, uh -uh. God is not one bit impressed. Looking down the list, item number three, God is also not one bit impressed with people starting with yours truly, who come to a place like this on Sunday morning and of course want to look at our best and want to be our best and want to speak and think and pray and sing clearly and do all the rest and who come here looking good and uh, who hear pray and hear scripture, but who then go out the door and act as if there's this total disconnect. Who go out the door having said one thing here about love of neighbor, about compassion, about kindness, about treating others as we would be treated, but then who go out and proceed to lash back and hate and hurt. Because God, it turns out, is much more concerned about what we do with all of this time that we have on our hands outside of this place how we deal with everyone around us out there in that world. And that we care for them with the same love and care that we would want them to show to us. And maybe, and especially if they are not a part of this or any other congregational family. And then finally getting to the bottom of the list as John finally directs my and our attention down to the very bottom. Number four, item number four is, if we think John is tough, just wait till we meet the Lord who is coming. Because John himself says, I am not worthy even to touch the guy's sandals, the lowest duty of the slave. The one who is coming, winnowing fork in hand, fire in the other hand. And guess who is coming to give a good threshing once and for all? 
And so as Luke's gospel puts it, with these and other such exhortations, John the Baptist proclaims the good news this Advent season. To which, you know, if you're like me, you just want to say, whoa. Okay, so, so this is the good news. Wow, I don't really want to hear the bad news, I guess. You know, have I missed something here? I mean, uh, it's it's harsh news. Yeah, definitely. It's it's unsettling news. Yes, it's alarming news. Yes, it's not feel-good stuff for sure. It's unchristmasy as I think about it. Yes, definitely, but, but good. What does Luke mean by saying good news here? The answer, I think, lies starting with the fact that Luke isn't talking about good the way we tend to think about good. What I maybe call good with a small g, you know? It tastes good, feels good, it's fun, it's nice, it's, it's what I like, it, it's, yes, I'll take more, please. We're having a good time. I love a good time, much better than a bad time. But that's not what Luke, talking about. And um, Louise and Lois, I, I hope I don't embarrass you too much by putting you on the spot, but the both of you came to mind in thinking about your past year as I hear these words of Luke. And I think about the fact that certainly neither of you wanted to hear from the doctor anything about brain aneurysms. A year ago this time, not on the radar screen, for sure. And soon after this time, a year ago, those words became a part of your lives, of their lives. And there is no way on earth that either Lois or Louise or their spouses or their families or any of us as their sisters and brothers were in any way glad to hear that the tests disclosed brain aneurysms, which needed to be treated. But at the same time, the news came with the chance to make it right. Thank God, Lois, who started this long journey with that health emergency, by God's grace and wonderful skills of doctors and nurses and caregivers, and all the prayers was saved and brought back to us and through all of it. But through that news came word, completely unaware a year ago right now, that they were there like ticking time bombs. And the doctors said, here's what we found, here's what we need to do. Good news, heavens no. A good day, no with a small g, but good news with a capital G, as in we found a problem and here's what we're gonna do and we're gonna deal with it and we're gonna get beyond it. There's a major problem, that's the tough part, that's the bad part, but the good news is now we know and there's a way forward, and there's still time to make it right. That's, I think, what it comes down to that John is about this Advent season. It's not good news as in, what a good time hearing those words from John. What a good reading that was. Boy, I just felt so, so positive about it. Not in the least. It's not something we want to hear. It's not exactly something to celebrate. But John comes to tell us that all is not well. We don't live the way that God intends, none of us. There's a problem, a severe problem. But the good news is there's a way forward. There's a fix. Something is to be done. It's not going to be easy. Again, thinking of our sisters Lois and Louise, it's not going to be a cakewalk, in this case the cure of which John speaks, also is going to involve suffering and nails, bleeding, death even, on our behalf. But there will be 
you win? Thanks to God. So in response to all of this, everybody, it seems, who goes out to hear John says, okay, we, we get it. Now, what, what do we do? What, what next? And what does John say? But go out, tax collectors and soldiers. You don't necessarily stop what you're doing, but in everything you do, treat the people around you as you would wish to be treated. Show others mercy, fairness, compassion. So ironic, of course, that those things maybe are in rather short supply in general, these days in which we live, but ironically, even in normal times, this time of year, so often, you know, surprisingly in short supply as tempers wear thin and patience is tested. So I think what John would say to us this day, one small proposal, one, one place to start is that we focus anew, we recommit ourselves anew, taking these words to heart and making ourselves beacons to the world, beacons of the gospel, beacons of all things being made new. Beacons of the fact that God is coming and all is going to be fixed and cured and healed in God's good time. Think of the stars up on the steeple looking so beautiful every evening. Let's make this our day to be recommitted to the fact that we will be beacons. Joining John in all that we say and do. In being those who show good news. The gospel to all people. Please uh, join me in turning in your bulletin to the creed, the proclamation of faith that we're using today, a reminder of just how amazing this God indeed is. Let us join together. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. And now, at the time of our musical anthem slot, we are delighted to welcome Caroline to our piano bench to share her musical gifts with us as the first of what we hope will be many such times that the gifts of our congregational family will be shared. And so, Caroline, thank you. to get up in front of people and do that. That's a whole different thing, right? Than doing it in your own living room or somewhere like that. Thank you so much. What an inspiring piece. Thank you. And so we go to our time of prayer, having been put in the right frame of mind for that. 
Would you please stand as we turn to our time of prayer, ending, of course, then with the Lord's Prayer. In this season of watching and waiting, we pray for all people and places that yearn for God's presence. Holy God, renew your church and raise up leaders who announce your good news. Grant peace to congregations and to seminarians in the midst of transition. Here in our, clear, in our Upper Dolphin Conference, we pray for our neighbors at Emmanuel Church in Williamstown and for their interim pastor, Dell. We pray too, O oh God, that you would continue to guide the work of candidacy and call committees in matching congregational families and pastors. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Creating God, your spirit brought forth the earth and all that is in it. Breathe life into us, that we would be inspired to live in harmony with one another and with this planet that you have given to us as our home. We pray at this time for those who lead us in this area and in every area in the important work of education, the students and teachers and families who work together to balance safety and learning, both of them so very important. We continue to lift up now uh, our medical professionals, and as we have been doing now low these many, many weeks, dear God, we pause to call by name before you in prayer. Paulette, Janet, Jody, Gwen, Peyton, Kristen, Sarah Schaefer, Stephen, Michelle, Joanne, David, Todd, Joshua, Elena, Courtney Pfeiffer, Sarah Paul, Bobby, Angela, Cindy, Whitney, Haley, Shannon, Courtney Miller, Rami, Heidi, Shawnee, Rose, Nicole, Tanya, Sarah, Abigail, Robert, Courtney Foreman, Glenn, Ann, Olivia, Seth, Rachel, Gary, Timothy, Gabrielle, Daniel, Rochelle, Gerald, Brett, and Chelsea. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Shepherd and God, you lead your people in paths of righteousness. Raise up prophets in our own day who warn us against captivity to greed and who point us to the freedom found in generosity. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Nurturing God, you come near in times of worry and need. Cradle us in your arms that we may trust you and are not afraid. Attend to all who are hungry, imprisoned, or ill or dealing with brokenness of any kind this day. We pray for Louise, for Judy, for Jane, for Warren, for Marzette, for Cora, for Joyce, for Donna, for Lois, and for these loved ones we now name before you. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Rejoice in God, you exult over us in singing. Enliven the song of this assembly. Bless the ministry of all who serve in the work and service of music. With instruments and dance, join our voices to the song of all creation. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. We give you thanks to your God for your servants who showed us your goodness and your grace. By the power of your spirit, keep us steadfast in faith, including shortly as we gather in this important meeting as a congregational family, until that day when we make our home with you. Hear us, O God, your mercy is granted. God of new life, you come among us in the places we least expect. Receive these prayers in those of our hearts in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. 
Now may God direct our ways in peace. May God make us abound in love for one another and for all. May God strengthen our hearts until the coming of our Lord Jesus. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless us now and forevermore. Amen. Please be seated for our closing song this morning. following the dismissal momentarily. Uh, as Judy begins her postlude, I'll extinguish the candles. And uh, we'll ask you simply just to, to stay put, uh, if you're able, as we hope you are, for the meeting to stay. Um, following the meeting, or as you go forth, please remember the things downstairs, um, including Miss Laurie, who could use a hand with some tables and chairs. And then following the congregational meeting, we're going to go right into our December council meeting. So I won't be outside to, to greet you all or at the door. Um, so I'm sorry about that, but please, if there was something you wanted to let me know or were counting on seeing me about, please just stop by, call, email, whatever is, is easiest. I'll be around this afternoon as well for the gingerbread bash, so uh, we can hopefully catch up then. So again now, may God direct our ways in peace, make us abound in love for one another and for all, Strengthen our hearts until the coming of Lord Jesus. And so now, go in peace. Christ is with us. We will. Thanks be to God. <laughs>